Today we are going to be talking about the neurological basis of behavior, but we are going to go into further into the specializations. Before I do that, let us recap of what we did the last time. In lesson 1, we did the scope of neurological basis of behavior. What does it involve? It studies feeding, simpler behaviors like feeding, drinking, thirst, temperature, right up to complex behaviors such as thinking, personality, growth, development of the brain, etc. And then we talked about the various uh, definitions possible which encompass all the areas that come under the scope of neurological basis of behavior. In lesson 2, we did a historical development of this discipline from the various contributors who were important in development of the discipline. Those whose work was so well recognized that it became the Nobel Prize winner. And those who were across the globe from Russia, Europe, US and all over the various laboratories of the world. And what is happening now? So the historical development to date is what we did in lesson number 2. In lesson number 3, we are going to be talking about the various specializations and the sub-specializations which fall under this discipline and which contribute to this discipline, which is the neurology. Of course, there are many, 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 as many bases and as many disciplines and as many specializations as there are scientists working or teams of scientists working. But we bring them under a general heading of about five or six, which we will be going through. So, don't be surprised that sometimes you go into biology, sometimes you will be doing neurochemistry, sometimes you will be doing neurophysics, sometimes you will be doing uh, physiology, sometimes even neuroanatomy. So you will be going through all these different disciplines one by one. So let me just take you through it. The first discipline that we will talk about is comparative psychology. Comparative psychology as the name implies, compares different species of animals of which the homo sapien, me, you and I, everyone, human beings, biologically known as the homo sapiens. So we fall within the animal kingdom. Therefore, comparative psychology which is one aspect of the study of the neurological basis of behavior will study the various animals across the phylogenetic scale, the various animals in the kingdom that we describe the animal kingdom. And the animal kingdom will be giving us the basis of studying how the brain develops and the functioning of the brain as it goes along. But not just that. We are also interested in the consequences of the brain interaction with behavior. When the brain interacts with behavior, what happens? When the brain interacts with behavior, at the simpler level of aplysia or the simple level of the mice or the rat or the cat and if you go higher at the dog and the primate the closest of the humans, the homo sapiens. So we want to see and we want to compare the various aspects of behavior as they are modulated by the brain. And therefore, comparative psychology gives us a detail. Now comparative psychology uses several methodologies. And I remember talking to you about ethological methods and the ethology, influence of ethology which is basically naturalistic, trying to understand behavior as it occurs, where it occurs, when it occurs. So behavior as is, is studied in the 
ethological method which comparative psychology uses. It also has a very strong evolutionary basis which means that it tries to understand behavior as it has evolved across the evolutionary stages. And of course, it also then tries to analyze what happens within the brain as a consequent or a consequence of those changes and what happens in the human brain and how does it compare with the lower animals. It also encompasses several methods apart from the naturalistic method that I told you which is basically Darwinian evolutionary uh, perspective. It also uses laboratory techniques. So the range is from the naturalistic to the strong laboratory methodology which uses very stringent techniques. What this comparative psychology basically does that it is there to develop theoretical frameworks and these theoretical frameworks are derived and develop on the basis of the range of methodologies that I've given you and the range of experiments that I've given you and you know controlled to naturalistic and what they're doing is trying to relate the biological framework. So development of theory and development of theory to understand how behavior developed and what is the commonality between the various phylogenetic scale animals and what are the differences and how do you account for those differences if you see these differences in animals and that we see is what comparative psychology is. So basically animals are studied and humans if they are studied which they rarely studied in comparative they are done from the perspective of taking us the homo sapiens as one of the animals in the animal kingdom. Secondly the perspective is evolutionary. Thirdly, the perspective is to develop a theoretical framework. So this is pure research, not applied. So applied research would be other disciplines, comparative psychology would be pure research. Now, we come to other disciplines within the uh, uh, neurological basis of behavior. And the next discipline that we have is the discipline of behavioral neurosciences. Now behavioral neurosciences actually what it does is behavioral neurosciences studies behavior from a neuroscientific perspective. So neurological basis of behavior also goes into the relationship which we have just described. The major, major subdivisions that we have are in psychology. The range is wide, which is from animals to humans. Then the controls, again, from the extreme control in the laboratory, we control the temperature, the food, the environment, the variables, all of them that you are, except for the one that you want to manipulate, to the naturalistic. And behavioralistic, behavioral neuroscientists also use very naturalistic and I will give you examples later on of what kind of naturalistic and experiments can be done using this particular technique. Then the research as I told you about comparative can be purely because you want to develop theoretical frameworks or you are just un interested in understanding behavior as it occurs and to give explanations for it. You are not interested in giving the world an applied or a, 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 a theory which is applicable in the real world. So the pure scientist and the pure behavioral neuroscientist is working isolated in the laboratory and he is working on his own he is not interested in if his contribution is going to make a difference in the world outside. It may, it may not. And we have seen it does. In some cases, where they take the findings of peer research and you apply them in the real world. But this is not the goal of the pure behavioral neuroscientist. He tries to study behavior for the sake. 
it may have many many underpinnings he may be doing it because it is his personal interest he may be doing it it is because his specialization he may be doing it because recent researches have raised questions which he would like to answer let me give you one example when i was doing my phd in the us around the late 70s early 80s there was this discovery of the brain opioids now the brain opioids is if you understand that the brain manufactures its own opiates heroin morphine why would the brain do that now the scientists at that time wanted to understand when this discovery came in and give a theoretical explanation theorize why would nature put in brain opiates within the brain ah. so the laboratory is for developing explanations for the scientist for developing theories hypotheses and testing them the applied is where these explanations could be used or an applied research is like a pharmacological research where drugs are manufactured not just to understand the functions of the drugs uh uh they are done to understand how these drugs are going to be used to influence the pathology the psychopathology schizophrenia depression anxiety you name it and this is what applied research means that they are very focused on creating a drug or a substance which would make a difference now then there is another way of looking at it the approach could be experimental where the variables are controlled and manipulated so experiments are carried out or it could be clinical and we will see some of the areas within this discipline are also clinical oriented which means that these discipline studies psychopathology from the perspective of the brain but not just to study it but also to give the assessments rehabilitation and strategies for making a difference in the life of those who are brain damaged so when we are talking about all these ranges i've just talked about that we are neurosciences which is one of the comparative was one we were neurosciences another the range is from animals to humans controls could be extreme to naturalistic research could be pure or applied and approach could be experimental or clinical now let's go into other disciplines and other aspects of the the specializations of this discipline which is we are going to be studying physiological psychology physiological so physiology becomes the focus how does physiology make a difference in the behavior or how does physiology affect behavior physiological psychology studies the neural modulates of behavior what are the neuronal neural and the neurophysiological mechanisms which affect and modulate behavior now what it does is uses direct manipulation of the brain direct manipulation of the brain and therefore understand when you talking about direct manipulation of the brain you cannot work with humans you are working with animals so physiological psychology works with animals and works on modulating understanding the modulates of behavior and these modulates can be studied through extremely stringent conditions of controlled experiments now why would controlled experiments be used let me say controlled experiments are used so that you are sure of the conditions that you are using you control all conditions except for one that you are interested in so you can be sure you can say that because i manipulated only one variable the findings are because of that variable or the change in that variable the manipulation of the nervous system very complex 
a very complex task. And remember, in the beginning, in lesson one and lesson two, I told you there are billions of neurons and glial cells. There are trillions of connections within these. And there are trillions of these neurochemical molecules running around. So, manipulation of the nervous system is a very complex strategy, requires highly specialized skills. The physiological psychologist is a surgeon who is working in the laboratory on animal brains. Now, therefore, we can say study of the nervous system using physiological psychological techniques would require surgery of the brain and these surgical procedures are many. Why would these surgical procedures be used? These surgical procedures are very, very complex. They are used to stimulate the brain or stimulation can be in many ways. It could be electrodes implanted within the brain and I, you will see the picture of electrodes and you see how the electrodes once they are the pulsating electrical impulse if it goes into directly into the brain it will bring about a change. So, the experiments that are carried out surgery, electrical stimulation or chemical stimulation we implant chemicals in the brain and then see the influence on the behavior. But we can also use the same mechanism the electrical or chemical means to damage the brain or destroy or as we call it lesion the parts of the brain that we are interested in. Lesioning means that you damage a very small a very specific area of the brain and then see the subsequent effect on behavior. And therefore it is very clear that physiological psychology cannot do these experiments on humans. These are formal experiments carried out only in animals and again in animals there has to be a very strong ethical basis of which I mean it, there are stringent procedures of ethics by which you can do this to animals as well. But in the name of humanity and of benefit to humanity we do do that. This experimentation requires extremely stringent control and we know that physiological psychology and especially if you are working with the brain would require controls of the rest of the variable which precludes. Agar aapne control karna hai kisi cheez ko, iska matlab ye hai ki uske baare mein aapko tamam jo variables hain wo jo kaam kar rahe hain, wahaan un variables ki aapko exact information hai. So, knowledge of the variables is extremely important which means आप अगर physiological psychology में experiment करने जा रहे हैं, तो आप एक specialist हैं. You cannot enter into a laboratory and say, आज मुझे ये काम करना है, जैसे science fiction की फिल्मों में होता है, no. These are extremely professionally competent, trained scientists who are working with animals. Now, this is very well understood, understood because these are experiments done in the laboratories and require manipulation of the brain, damaging, stimulating, surgery, that the use of humans is eliminated. Physiological psychology therefore does not use humans, even with animals. There is a strict and a stringent code of ethics which has to be followed. And as I said, this is because you are doing it for the benefit of humanity that these animal experiments are allowed. This is an area which focuses on identifying variables, creating theoretical frameworks 
which is developing theories to explain behavior, to predict behavior, rather than producing applied ramifications or applied oriented results or to produce results which will be application of the theoretical principles in the real world. The physiological psychologist is isolated from the real world. His ideas may come from the real world, but he is not interested in the application of his findings in the real world. In physiological psychology, therefore, pure research is a priority. It may or may not have an application later on, but the scientist in his laboratory is working purely on discovery, purely on identification of variables and purely on development of theories. And this is needed. Where would the practical applications come from if you do not have the theories? These theories provide the foundations of later discoveries and of course applications of behavior. The next discipline that we are going to study is very much an applied discipline and this applied discipline that we are talking about is psychopharmacology. Psychopharmacology has evolved out of the basis of biology, pharmacy, psychology, physiological psychology and all these disciplines put together amalgamated become psychopharmacology. Earlier when we were doing PhD way back in the late 70s and 80s, physiological psychologists were also psychopharmacologists. They were doing research on drugs and behavior. They were also biopsychologists working in influences of behavior. These disciplines are similar in a way because psychopharmacology also begins understanding the influence of drugs exogenously manufactured. When I say exogenously manufactured, which means manufactured outside the body and outside the brain. We want to take those substances and see their influences on the brain molecules, on the neurons, on the interaction of the neurons with each other. That is what psychopharmacology is all about. And therefore, psychopharmacology would use animals. Psychopharmacology would be a laboratory. It will begin and continue in a very strict control of variable studies and these studies are series of studies where you would be first of all discovering the molecules and then using the molecules within the brain and then not just that you are interested in behaviors at the same time you are also interested in what we call the dose. You know, you when you go to the pharmacist and you buy a cough syrup, he will ask you what strength, how many milligrams per kilogram or how many milligrams, sorry, how many milligrams, mg's. You have an aspirin or an avil, 25 mg, 50 mg, 100 mg. So, the strength of the dose increases and of course, the potency of the effect also increases the effect becomes stronger. And how do we know that? It is because laboratory studies have demonstrated that. And these laboratory studies begin with and end with the animals. And once this discovery is made, then we move into the human studies, if this drug is to be applicable to humans. Now, if we are looking at psychopharmacology as a discipline, we have talked about First, that there is a physiological methods of physiological psychology involved or biopsychology involved. It is experimental in nature. It is very much applied because the effect of this drug 
is going to be or the psychopharmacological substance is going to be marketed and it is going to be used in clinics and it is going to be used for the benefit of the patients. So, it is very much an applied oriented subject within the domain of neurological basis of behavior. This is an experimental study because when you are studying the effect of drugs, the molecules, the range is from the cellular within the smallest cell and its interaction within the brain to the behavioral which is the gross behavior which changes such as schizophrenia or the psychopathology such as schizophrenia, such as depression, such as um, anxiety and there are of course drugs for hyperactivity, the behavior changes. So, the, the patient who is hyperactive is given a drug which slows down or makes the behavior controllable. So, cellular to behavioral level that is the scope of the study of psychopharmacology. Again remember the experiments in psychopharmacology will also be under strict control. Now, the strict control comes in because there is a different focus. You are talking about the neural activity and behavior and the interaction of the drug within the brain, within the neurons affecting behavior. So, each one of these variables has to be strictly controlled so that we are sure that the drug that we have studied and the effect that we have studied can be related very specifically to each other. So, the molecule and the neuron and the neurochemical and the behavior all have to be very strongly identified and all other possibilities ruled out. Otherwise, you may have disasters and we have had history of disasters where not very well studied drugs were brought into the market. The side effects were not very well studied and there is we are going to be talking about this later. A whole series of discoveries were made that drugs had a disastrous effect and behavioral teratology emerged as a discipline which studied the effects of drugs and other toxins on behavior and the brain. And one of the drugs that I may recall used was used in the 60s thalidomide. It was a sedative given to mothers and the effect was not studied. It did not affect the mother, but all women who were carrying fetuses, the fetuses were severely deformed and the thalidomide cases then gave rise to a discovery that we need to and emphasize that we need to study drugs before we market. And I mean, there are accidents do happen, and people do. If you remember, there are drugs which are recalled because of the serious side effects. And this psychopharmacology is the study of drugs, influence on behavior, the changes that occur in behavior, and the changes that occur within the brain. And this is one very applied aspect of neurological basis of behavior. This specialization therefore, focuses on identifying the effects of the substances created in the pharmaceutical companies and there are sometimes funding research within the universities and the laboratories, so that they can they fund the research and the scientists work in the laboratories and their findings are taken by the pharmaceuticals. The research carried out in laboratories is on uh, animal subjects. So, it is not on human subjects that we carry out uh, laboratory experiments. However, because this is eventually going to be marketed and being used in human subjects, this psychopharmacology has one aspect in which drugs then are tested out at a certain level 
in humans as well. Now, when does this arrive? Once you have studied it, it was manufactured, studied at the lower level of animals, the rats, the, the mice, the rats, the cats and so on, you move up the phylogenetic scale to the point where you reached an experiment with primates. It was found to be safe for use of humans and then as it happens, volunteers are sought out. Now, these volunteers which are sought out are those for example, in schizophrenia or in depressed, those who have tried out other substances, other drugs and it has not affected them, but they are willing to try out this new drug. This is very much a consented agreement where the patient is willing to go through these experiments because the patient wants to get well. So, this is a new drug which will be tried out and the patient consents to. So, human subjects are used only with consent, volunteers and those who understand that the consequences could affect them positively or there may be some side effects which are very well documented beforehand. Even with this volunteer, there are stringent procedures and stringent ethical guidelines for use of human subjects for doing psychopharmacological research. In summary, psychopharmacology has the basis in basic research, in pure research, but then it moves into applied areas. It uses animals, but then it moves into humans as well. It is an area which sort of bridges between the brain and behavior using the pharmacological substances and their effects as the bridge. So, psychopharmacology is pure and applied at the same time. It is pure when it develops theoretical models which can then be or theoretical basis of drugs or substances and their interaction which can therefore later on be used for developing pharmaceutical substances which will then fit into the theoretical model. I will just give you one example of this. Amphetamine is a substance which, which is if you intaken causes hyperactivity or hyperactivity in the sense it is in the street it is called speed or rocket on the. Uh, if it is sold on the street. It is the medical name for amphetamine is Ritalin. Ritalin is a drug which is used for treating children with hyperactivity. Looking at Ritalin or amphetamine, how it interacts with the brain neurochemicals, one neurochemical stood out or a chain of neurochemicals which stood out, dopamine which we will talk about later when we do doing neurochemicals and it was found that amphetamine interacts with dopamine. Interacts with dopamine that it increases if I take a pill of amphetamine, it increases the level of dopamine in the brain and then the, the person who has taken that pill starts exhibiting hyperactive behaviors and even if he keep continues to take it, he starts having delusions and uh, hallucinations and all kind of symptoms which are similar to schizophrenia. Now, laboratory experiments have demonstrated that. Therefore, drugs which were earlier introduced for treatment of schizophrenia were those drugs which reduced dopaminergic levels in the brain. So, here is a good example of the discoveries in the laboratories and the pharmaceutical substances that were developed after these discoveries. So, a very nice combination of pure and applied research that goes on within pharma, uh, psychopharmacological research. It can also be used the other way around. Drugs which were used on humans discovered and used in, on humans and they are taken then to the laboratory 
to study the effects of these on the brain. LSD, lysergic acid diethylamide, a very powerful hallucinogenic substance was manufactured in the 40s and it was the drug of entertainment used in the 60s, the flower children of the 60s used this drug. We have yet to know the exact components and the exact interaction of what happens in the brain. Then marijuana, what we call bhang charas, that substance has been used by humans for a, a long time. But what happens within the brain? Where do the cannabinoids, does do these cannabinoids, the chemical substance, where do these cannabinoids interact in the brain? So, taking a drug which is being used by humans into the laboratory and studying it again, the reverse order that applied into pure and so this goes on in psychopharmacology. Another area of um, interest within the uh, neurological basis of behavior is neuropsychology. Neuropsychology is the youngest, most dynamic and most happening area of neurological basis of behavior. What it does is studies very specifically the effects of damage and deficit which has taken place in the human brain and studying these effects through neuropsychological tests and assessing them, measuring them and suggesting rehabilitation strategies. So therefore, this is a new discipline which focuses on the human brain, which focuses on the damage to the human brain and subsequent deficits. Damage hone ke baad jo cheez affect hui, for example, koi area aisa hai meri brain mein jo meri ungli ki functioning ko ya mein likhne ke liye jo istamal karti hoon apni ungliyan aur haath, to ye agar kabhi damage ho, to mere haath se pen, pencil pakkarna muskil ho, ye neuropsychologist ka kaam hai ki assess kare ki kya uska asar tha aur kaha hua ye effect और इसको अगर अब मैंने दोबारा लिखना शुरू करना है तो मुझे किस तरह से दोबारा इसको स्ट्रैटेजीज को डेवलप करना होगा कि मैं लिख सकूं सो न्यूरोसाइकोलॉजी फोकसेस ऑन ह्यूमन सब्जेक्ट्स न्यूरोसाइकोलॉजी का बड़ा एक अप्लाइड फोकस है प्योर रिसर्च भी जरूरी है और हुई है इस एरिया में इसकी शुरुआत में अगर आपको याद होगा आई टॉक्ड अबाउट ब्रोका and I talked about Luria from Russia, Broca from France and I talked about Gazaniga and Sperry from the US. These are the neuropsychology pioneers who have had in the deficits laboratory mein patients, stroke patients who have had stroke, ho gaya, accidents, ho gaya, brain damage ho gaya, ya gunshot wounds in the jungle brain damage hua. Un sab की स्टडीज के बाद ये एक डिसिप्लिन इमर्ज किया अब इसमें एक बात तो बिल्कुल वाजे है कि आप ह्यूमंस पे अगर कर रहे हैं तो पोस्ट हॉक है कि जब डैमेज हो गया उसके बाद इसको स्टडी करेंगे यू कैन नॉट क्रिएट अ डैमेज इन द ह्यूमंस इफ यू रिमेंबर फिजियोलॉजिकल साइकोलॉजी डिड क्रिएट लीजंस डेफिसिट्स इन द ब्रेन ऑफ एनिमल्स इट इज ऑफ कोर्स ethically not possible and humanly not possible that you create damage within the laboratory or in human brains. You can't do that. So what it is, it is studying after the damage has taken place and relating the damage to the deficit that you see in behavior. Ab is mein do teen bade mashoor cases hain. Ek hai Phineas Gage ka. फिनियस गेज का जिक्र मैंने पहले भी किया था लेसन टू में फिनियस गेज बिगलो ने जिसमें पहली दफ़ा केस रिपोर्ट इसकी दी थी फिनियस गेज एक रेलवे वर्कर था और रेलवे की लाइन डल रही थी और इसने एक वो 
स्टील का डाल के ना उसमें बारूद उसको इंतज़ार कर रहा था कि ये फटे तो ये मिट, मिट्टी और जो पत्थर वत्थर है वो हट जाए तो ताकि वहाँ पर रेलवे की वो डाली जा सके लाइन अब उसने वो पकड़ी हुई थी और उसी तरह जब बारूद गलती से फट गया और वो रॉड उसकी आँख में से यहाँ से जाते हुए दूसरी साइड से सर से निकल के उड़ गई फिनेस गेज की यहाँ से जो रॉड गई है और बाहर से निकल गई है फिनेस गेज बेहोश हो गया लोगों ने उठा के अस्पताल ले गए ये 1880 के करीब का वाक है फिनेस गेज अस्पताल में रहा कुछ देर ठीक हो गया उसके बाद वापस आया तो पहले वो फिनेस गेज और था वो एक बड़ा अच्छा शहरी था नेक बाप था उसके फ़ौर बाद जब ये डैमेज हुआ फिर इस गए शराबी गालियाँ देने वाला बच्चों को मारने वाला कत्ल गारत करने वाला बिल्कुल उसकी पर्सनालिटी चेंज हो गई तो ये आप समझिए कि न्यूरोसाइकोलॉजी की एक शुरुआत है स्टडीज़ की इसी तरह एक और पेशेंट है जिसका हर किताब में जिक्र है उसका नाम सिर्फ दो इनिशियल्स हैं एच एम एच एम को कोई ऐसा स्ट्रोक हुआ जिसकी वजह से उसकी द द एरियाज विच स्टोर मेमोरी लॉन्ग टर्म मेमोरी वर इफेक्टेड ना एच एम हैज बिन लिविंग फॉर द लॉन्गेस्ट तीस साल एक हो गए हर रोज उस पर तजर्बा होता है हर रोज वो भूल जाता है हिज मेमरी इज ओनली शॉर्ट टर्म पंद्रह से बीस मिनट से ज्यादा वो याद नहीं रहता उसको कि उसको ये याद नहीं रहता कि मैं इसी कमरे में पिछले तीस साल से रह रहा हूँ अस्पताल का वो कमरा तो एच एम का केस है एक फिनियस गेज और इस तरह के बहुत सारे केसेस हैं जिसकी बेसिस पे न्यूरोसाइकोलॉजी की फाउंडेशंस ले हुई हैं और उसके आगे टेस्ट डेवलप हुए लूरिया ने जंग फर्स्ट वर्ल्ड वॉर में टेस्ट लोगों की जो गन शॉट हुई है ब्रेन में डैमेज हुआ उसकी स्टडी की एक मैं आपको छोटा सा एक एग्जाम्पल दूँ लूरिया का मोटर टेस्ट है कि आप यूँ हाथ रखिए और देखिए कि आपकी उंगलियाँ ये इस तरह से हिलती हैं अगर ट्रेमर है इसका मतलब ये कोई स्टडी करने की ज़रूरत है अगर स्टेबल है दोनों हाथ स्टेबल हैं इसका मतलब ये कि मोटर सिस्टम ख़ास तौर पे हाथ वाले ठीक हैं इसी तरह कहा जाए मुझे या मैं आपको कहूँ कि अपने दाएं हाथ से अपने बाएं कान को हाथ लगाए पकड़ें अब किस तरह आप पहले सोचेंगे कि बाया कौन सा और दायाँ कौन सा ये एस्टीमेट करने भी में भी हम टेस्ट करते हैं कि ये एस्टीमेशन में ये देर क्यों हुई क्या आपको लेफ्ट और राइट की डिस्क्रिमिनेशन आसानी से हो सकती है या नहीं हो सकती खैर ये दिस इज न्यूरोसाइकोलॉजी ओके न्यूरोसाइकोलॉजी देर फोर बेस्ड ऑन केस स्टडीज एंड न्यूरोसाइकोलॉजी देर फोर स्टडीज आफ्टर द स्ट्रोक्स और डेफिसिट्स हैव टेकन प्लेस Neuropsychology is not experimental. It is at best correlational. It correlates the damage with the evidence of the damage. It focuses mainly on the neocortex. The neocortex is the new cortex, and the, therefore neocortex means higher order functions are studied by neuropsychology. Very strongly applied. Neuropsychology is an applied discipline. because we assess we measure neuropsychologically and then why do we measure because essentially to understand what the deficit was with the aim of localizing those deficits and with the aim of helping the patients with those deficit to rehabilitate to develop strategies so that they can live a fairly normal life so counseling care डायग्नोसिस काउंसलिंग केयर एंड रिहेबिलिटेशन ये इसका बड़ा अप्लाइड फोकस है ये नॉन इन्वेसिव है ये ब्रेन को डैमेज नहीं करती हम खुद नहीं करते इसमें कंट्रोल एक्सपेरिमेंट्स या कंट्रोल मेजर्स भी हैं जैसे टेस्ट वगैरह आपको बताएं और फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी भी है फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी इस तरह से है कि अगर एक पेशेंट है जिसको स्ट्रोक हो गया है अगर कुछ प्रोसीजर्स ले डाउन है कि मैंने टेस्ट देना है तो मैं लूरिया की एक ये ख़ास फिलासफी है कि फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी इज निट इन टू द न्यूरोसाइकोलॉजिकल असेसमेंट्स एंड देर फोर यू कैन टेस्ट एवरी फंक्शन एंड एनी फंक्शन 
so long as you can use the flexibility of your assessments. Agla jo third last discipline is me hai is psychophysiology. Psychophysiology studies the relationship of physiology and behavior by recording the ongoing electrophysiological responses. Is me khas taur pe human subjects me hum karte hain. To pehle ye ki ye electrophysiology record karta hai human subject me karta hai. Kya cheez hai electrophysiology? आपका हर मसल जो है और हर जो हिस्सा है जिस्म का उसमें एक इलेक्ट्रिकल चार्ज है उस इलेक्ट्रिकल चार्ज को मेजर करते हुए और उसके टोन को मेजर करते हुए इलेक्ट्रो साइकोफिजोलॉजिकल मेजर्स हम इस्तेमाल करते हैं बहुत सारे बिहेवियर के बारे में इंफॉर्मेशन लेने के लिए अब स्कैल्प इलेक्ट्रोड्स हम लगाते हैं आपने ईईजी का नाम सुना होगा इलेक्ट्रो एंसोफेलोग्राफी इसका आगे जाके भी बात हम करेंगे ईईजी क्या है कि ब्रेन की इलेक्ट्रिकल एक्टिविटी को मेजर करने के लिए इलेक्ट्रोड्स लगाए जाते हैं और पेशेंट जो है उसको अगर ट्यूमर है या एपिलेप्सी है या और भी कुछ हो सकता है तो इलेक्ट्रिकल एक्टिविटी ब्रेन की बताती है डायग्नोसिस के लिए इस्तेमाल हो सकती है कि यहाँ पर ब्रेन में क्या हो रहा है ये बड़ी इंटरेस्टिंग है ईईजी बिकॉज शुरू की जो स्लीप रिसर्च थी ये दैट यू स्लीप रिसर्च यूज स्कैल्प इलेक्ट्रोड्स टू मेजर ब्रेन एक्टिविटी एंड इट वाज फाउंड दैट ब्रेन इलेक्ट्रिकल एक्टिविटी चेंजेस वाइल यू आर स्लीपिंग एट दैट वाज वी विल गो इन टू दैट वैन वी टॉक अबाउट स्लीप बट वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग that while you're sleeping your brain is buzzing away with electrical activity and then another measure is emg is electromyography where the neck muscles are measured for electrical activity very important in sleep jab sote sote gardan ko jhatka lagta hai that is when the neck muscles are paralyzed and we can measure a state of sleep which is known as rem sleep through this फिर इसी तरह से ई विच इज इलेक्ट्रो ऑक्यूलोग्राफी आई मूवमेंट इज आल्सो मेजर्ड इसी तरह से ई इलेक्ट्रोडर्मल रिस्पांस आपकी जब स्किन प्रस्पायर करती है तो इट बिकम्स अ गुड कंडक्टर इमोशनल इमोशनैलिटी मेजर की जा सकती है इमोशनल स्टेट मेजर किए जा सकते हैं इसी तरह हार्ट रेट बी वगैरह पीपल डायलेशन वगैरह मेजर किया जा सकता है नॉन इन्वेसिव है has been used it can be used for applied as well as pure research is me single cell recording bhi hai gross recording of the scalp bhi hai this is a very good technique but it can be used in conjunction with others cognitive neuroscience a core discipline hai jo isme aata hai very important newest and most exciting because cognitive neuroscience talks about higher order functioning like thinking memory intellectual functioning thinking memory perceptions attention judgment personality it uses mainly non invasive it is mainly in humans and it uses now functional imaging mri zagara cat scans pet scans we use karke aur badi ye rapidly develop ho raha hai cognitive neuroscience summary that all disciplines that i have talked about they work in isolation but they work in conjunction and collaboration with each other as well one formulates the theory the other tests it in the real world or one brings in evidence from the real world and laboratory tests it so each one of these disciplines complement the findings of the other they all work together to make the discipline what we call neurological basis of behavior a neurological basis of behavior has from the cellular to the gross behavior the findings from all these disciplines put together pure and applied animals and humans and cellular mechanism neurochemical to the drugs therefore you can see the vastness of this discipline it is enormous and it is growing and we will be studying parts of it as we go along so therefore we have studied today the basis of behavior comparative 
which compares the animals, all animals of the animal kingdom including humans, their development, their brain development, their behavioral development. Then we had physiological psychology, we had neuropsychology, psychopharmacology, cognitive neuroscience. And as you can see from the animals, the similarities of the animal behavior to the specialized behavior and brain aspects of humans, that is the scope of this discipline. We will be studying in some aspects when we do evolutionary perspectives of behavior, we will be studying comparative and physiological basis of behavior. And then we move on from physiological to neuropsychological and neurophysiological, we will be studying the electrical activity. Then we will be moving into the cognitive neurosciences and the neuropsychological aspects of behavior. So, all these taken in conjunction, all these working together give us the information that the brain is a highly complex organism within this body that you have. And the brain therefore cannot be studied from one perspective or cannot be studied from one science only. It has to be multidisciplinary and these disciplines working together provide therefore the basis of the data that we have or the basis of the information that we have or the basis of the facts that we have so far about the brain. We will be studying as we go along the evolution of the brain which came from the comparative psychology. We will be studying the neurochemicals and these neurochemicals within the brain which are modulated by behavior but at the same time also by the pharmacological substances. And we will be studying neuroanatomy as it is affecting neuropsychological correlates of behavior.